we begin our meditation on God's word in the name of Jesus, who is the one who makes us, sings triumphant. Dear Christian friends, what are you waiting for? You could really say those words in a couple of different ways, and it'll have an entirely different meaning. If you ask it like a question, you get an answer. Someone expects to hear something that you're waiting for. In the case of believers, we're waiting in faith, and we trust that God will do what he says he's going to do for us in forgiving our sins and preserving us in faith until Jesus comes again. We're waiting to be in that heavenly home above and to realize the full triumph that comes to us through his cross and resurrection. What are we waiting for? The saints triumphant, we're waiting for Jesus to come again. And he says, I'm coming soon. But you could say those words a little different way, and it's an entirely different thing altogether. If someone says, what are we waiting for? That's a call to action, isn't it? As believers, we know that in the time between Jesus coming, we're, we're to be very active in his church. He's got an important mission, and we think about how important it is to gather around God's word together and strengthen our faith so that we can share that faith with others who need Jesus around us and take as many people along with us and fill up heaven. Yes, it's a call to action. I'd like to keep both of those thoughts in mind as we go through God's word today. The text is taken from Hebrews chapter 12. It's written out for you on page three of your service folder. And I'll just walk through that text now. What are we waiting for? It is a good question for the saints of God to consider, and it's also a call to action. Well, did you notice how the prayer of the day today really brought out well both of the thoughts that come out of our theme today. We prayed before and said, Almighty God, so govern and rule our hearts and minds that ever mindful of your glorious return, we may persevere in both faith and holiness of living. In faith, the, the trust that God can and will do what he's promised us and that we'll be ready when Jesus comes again as we trust in his promises of forgiveness and salvation and that call to action, holy living. In response to God's grace, we seek to be a part of his saving work. Both of those aspects brought out well by our, the prayer of the day today. To the first part, though, about faith. The writer to the Hebrews in verse 2 calls on us to focus clearly on the object of our faith. See, faith isn't just something that you have in yourself or in each other. Often people say you got to have faith, but what really is it? It's faith that trusts Jesus is your only hope. He's the reason we're not separated from God because of our sins. So the writer says, by all means, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In other words, he's the one who from the beginning to the very end, he's done it all. He's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Everything the scriptures said that he would come and do, Jesus did. He fulfilled everything by coming into the world born as a little baby at Bethlehem, growing up to be a man and dying on the cross and rising again. He finished everything that was necessary for our salvation. It is not by works, but a gift of his grace. And it's the life of Jesus that changes everything for us, his death and resurrection. He did it all. What confidence of faith that gives us. And, and, and how comforting it is to know that he's He's still finishing things in a matter of speaking as in heaven. He rules over all things and he's guiding and protecting us and making things work out for our good, giving us what we need each day to make it on our sojourn through this life. Yes, he's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and the reason 
for it all. Why did Jesus do it? Joy. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. That's what kept Jesus going. That's what drove him forward. During all of the rejection in his ministry, yes, through the cross of Good Friday, what made him endure all the anguish and suffering on the cross when he was forsaken by his own dear father and separated from him and his love on the cross, what kept him going was joy. The prospect of seeing you and me together with all the saints who've gone before us in heaven and enjoying the eternal bliss of heaven, that joy, that thought of redeeming you and, and making a place for you in heaven kept Jesus going. He looked at everything involved in redeeming and saving you from sin. He looked at all of it as, as incredibly difficult and full of suffering it was. He said, it's nothing to me. I gladly do it for the joy of seeing you at my side in heaven. And then the writer says he sat down at the right hand of God. What are we waiting for? We know that when Jesus comes again, he will take us home. We have a place with him. We'll be able to stand in the judgment as we fix our eyes on Jesus. The reason for our forgiveness and salvation, we stand in confidence and also it gives us hope. Did you notice that the writer compares our faith life to being like a race? He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And to motivate us on the way, the writer says we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on. Yes, it's very difficult to keep on going when you're all alone in something difficult. But he says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. I want you to think of all the people in the Bible now in the Old Testament who've gone before us. The cloud of witnesses includes people like Noah and, and, and Moses and Abraham and, and people like Jacob and Joseph and, and King David and all the rest of the many believers who took God at his word and who trusted in him and kept on going and even died for their faith. They went through great suffering and they did it all even though in their lifetimes, they never got to see the, the fulfillment of everything that God promised them. You see, unlike you and I, they never saw or could look back at the fulfillment of Jesus coming in his birth at Bethlehem and Good Friday and Easter. Yes, still they kept on faithfully running that race, taking God at his word, even when the going got tough, they said, we're still all going to put our faith in God. And we're never going to be disappointed even when things don't turn out the way that we expected. We're going to keep going forward, trusting God in faith. He's never once let us down before, and he'll never let us down in the future. And again, we have even more reason to take God at his word. We can look back on all of the fulfillment of his of his words and prophecy. So you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses who would cheer you on in your faith. I saw something similar uh, a couple weeks ago. My family, as you know, went down to Texas to be there when Billy was graduating from uh, basic training in the Air Force. And uh, what you're looking at on the screen is uh, a day before graduation when they have something called the Airman's Run. Now that all these recruits have become airmen, they, they take part in an airman's run. It's part of the celebration that weekend. Um, you can imagine how encouraging it would be as all of the, the recruits and the new airmen come running into the Coliseum. Around they go in a circle, and in the infield and in the stands are all their family members and friends who are cheering them on and whistling and and uh, taking pictures. 
It's a, it's a proud moment and it's a good feeling with everyone you care about cheering you on because they all know that this really is just the start of um, something brand new in their life. They've got a whole career ahead of them, lots of challenges. It's not going to be easy, so good to have people cheering you on. Well, that's kind of what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about today. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, he says. So what are you waiting for? Now this time it's a, it's a call to action. Yes, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. As there's no time to lose, the first call to action would be to make sure you're spending time with God in his word. You see that great cloud of witnesses, you know, all the stories of those heroes of faith in the Bible, that cloud, it becomes even greater and it increases in, in glory and it gives you strength of faith as you turn the pages of scripture and as you read about their lives. Um, you see God's story in their lives. You see that the way God dealt with them is the way that he deals with us. In the same way that that cloud increases and is even more of an encouragement to you through Bible study, well, that, that cloud gets pretty thin, too, if we're not in God's Word. But as we go there, we are encouraged. We, we see and learn from their examples. We see their sin. We think about our own. We see God dealing with them in grace and love and disciplining those he loves, and we see him doing the same for us. Again, how important to run with perseverance the race marked out, out for us and to throw off the sin that hinders and entangles us, the writer says. So here's the call to action, too, to take a look around in your life, to see and examine and, and, and look at what are those things that, that kind of weigh us down and get us off track in life. You know, maybe... It's something that's even a blessing that's hindering you. Family can take us away from God and his word sometimes and all the endless pursuits, you know. But Jesus said, whoever loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. It might even be the blessing of friends and some things that you're doing with friends that are not God-pleasing. Or it can be a, a love for money and things that's kind of out of order and, and screws up your priorities in life. You think of Jesus' parable of the sower, for example, and how all the cares and concerns of this life serve to, to choke out faith. Let's throw it all off, the writer says, along with the sin that so easily entangles. As sin is all around us. All sin hurts. But sometimes there might be some kind of sin that is a unique temptation to us. There may be a, a pet sin, for example, that, that you feed, something that you even have grown to like in a way. But like some favorite piece of clothing that would get in the way of our legs moving or slow us down or entangle or trip us up, the writer says, throw it all off and let us run with rage with perseverance, the race marked out for us. In your families and in the congregation, a call to action here to strive for peace with everyone. Yes, notice the writer doesn't just say, stay in your lane on your race, keep your head down, keep looking forward, don't look to the right or left, stick to your business and ignore problems around you, hoping they'll go away. No, he says, strive for peace. Yes, look to work through problems and, and tackle issues in the family or in the church. Use God's word. Speak the truth in love. Yes, speak gently but firmly. Without compromising the faith, deal with these things. It's important. The holiness he mentions here is something that we can't enter heaven without. The holiness here is that believers' everyday state of grace 
and favor as he continues to work the gift of repentance in us and as we strive to do something different and thank him with lives that reflect his holy will. Yes, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Well, there's lots in these verses to unpack, but the writer's main point, again, is that we just, we don't have time, dear friends, to let sin of any kind tangle and trip us up or take root in our lives so that we're not ready when Jesus comes again. I got an email earlier this week from a, a fellow pastor in the area that bears this out. He says, hey, Bill, to say email, just got a call from Theta Karen, 18-year-old girl in car accident last night. Family said they were members of my church, but the girl has never been in our church. I married her mom to her dad, who died last year, and baptized her older brothers, but have never seen any of them, and not the girl ever, ever since spoke with the chaplain at Theta Care, thinking I should go down myself. Feels weird and sad, though. She's in ICU and not cognizant. Prayers would be appreciated. You know, that's no call that a pastor ever, ever wants to get. The time to prepare ourselves in faith is now, before that day of trouble comes, you know, how sad and tragic when families are scrambling like that to, to try to, to bring in some spiritual help, which is good. That should be the first call, but, but you'd hate to see it ever be too late. Jesus' parable today reminds us that no one knows when their time of grace will end and no one knows what hour he will return again. Jesus, our heavenly bridegroom, then tells us, be dressed and ready in faith. Keep your lamps filled with oil. That is faith that comes through hearing God's word on a regular basis. Keep your lamps trimmed and ready for his coming. And be ready through daily repentance and holiness of living. For our heavenly bridegroom will come at a time we do not expect it. So what are we waiting for? We know that Jesus will come, and we trust that God can and will do everything he said to do for us in pre preserving us in faith and giving us a place with him in heaven. What are we waiting for? It's a call to action, too, to continue to reach out to people in our lives, our families who need encouragement in the faith so that they're ready, too, when Jesus comes. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, continue to guard and keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.